it's, it's, it's a joy to talk about hard places, and I hope when you leave here that you take a hope with you that you may not have right now because it's there through the hard spots. I'll blast through some of this, the, the lot of details. I'm going to may leave out a few things that I shared Friday night just to kind of get through the end of the story. My story is approaching six years now and ongoing. I know that others in this room has a story, so mine is just one among many. I hope that at the end of me telling my story, your focus and your thoughts are not toward me, but on just how good and caring and sustaining and loving our Lord is. I could use many Bible verses and cliches and, and these kind of things to, to describe this, but I'll keep it simple and say, we never know what lies ahead nor how we will deal with it till we get there. January 12th uh, of 2012, this left side began to hurt. Been hurting for several weeks, even several months. Saw a local doctor in Straw Plains area where I live, a godly man and, and a friend of mine. He ran some tests and said, let's go on and do a CT scan and check out what might be going on in here. And, sent me over in Fountain City for a CT scan, and the, most of the problem that I felt was right in this lower left abdomen area. I know most of the stuff that can rupture and blow up is over here on the right side, but something over here was hurting. Um, about two hours later, we were done on a Friday morning right there behind the duck pond. Gone back to work. Everything's good. Mr. Allen, you're done. Everything looks good. Thank you. Boom, gone. Uh, that Friday afternoon, my phone rang at work, and it was my friend Donnie, the doctor, and uh, he said, are you where we can chat for a moment? And I said, sure, and I stepped out into the lobby um, by myself, but I wasn't alone. He said, Danny, I've prayed about making this phone call. Now or we'll wait until tonight when you were with your family. And he said, I felt I needed to go ahead and make the phone call now. I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. He said, some things have shown up on your scan this morning, and it appears you may have some tumors showing up in your abdominal area. I said, are you talking like uh, cancerous type stuff? And he said, it looks like it could be. That's an indescribable moment, and Joel had one of those. Well, you thought, no, this, 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 this is not me. Not me. And I said, is it a one or two or is it a little spot? He said, no, the re radiology report says there are numerous tumors. He said, I don't know how many. And he said, uh, I, he said the largest one is down in your abdomen and it looks like it's a little over four inches in diameter. Um, he said, there's others around uh, up in my neck, in the back side of my heart, going down the, my aorta artery, down in the spleen, lower left low, low barrier of my lung. I actually thought, and this is crazy, I actually thought they mixed up my CTs with, CT with somebody else. I thought they got the wrong guy here. It was mine, and it was cancer all over my midsection. Talked to Donnie sometime later, he was a friend of mine. He said it was one of the hardest phone calls that I've made. He said, you're a sick guy, but he said, I'm not giving you a death sentence yet. But he said, you've got a lot of work and a lot of treatment ahead of you. He had me an appointment. I said, I don't even have an oncologist, can't even spell the word. I can now. <coughs> he said, I've got an oncologist for you, local oncologist. Uh, Dr. Gravi is his name, great, great guy. He said, you'll be there Monday morning at 8.30. He'll be waiting on you and he'll have his test. He's looking for you. I thought, huh, now the hard part comes to go home and tell that lady sitting right over there that I live with and my kids that I love and a mom and dad that I love. How do I go home and tell them? I hung that phone up and I know right where I was standing in West Knoxville in my office. I hung that phone up and put it in my pocket. And I said, Lord, you're up to something. 
And in any way that you can take this and use this, that I can use this problem to honor you and glorify you, I want to do that. Had no idea of the path ahead. But I meant that then and I mean that now. I still have no idea. I still have no idea of the path ahead. But it sometimes doesn't matter because I know who's taking the journey with me. The battle was on, the fun was about to begin. We gotta identify what's going on. They done a tumor biopsy. <clears throat> Those things aren't a lot of fun. The report came back and Dr. Gravi said, um, they've diagnosed you with testicular cancer. But he said, I think they've misdiagnosed you. This was a Friday afternoon. He said, I'm gonna have Fort Sanders run the tissue again and I'm gonna fly a piece of tissue to California to a lab out there that I like to see what they say. The confirmation came back, the new diagnosis was there. Um, it was large diffuse B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma stage four. The next step was you, you, you start preparing for all this chemo and then you start doing lung tests and heart tests and kidney tests. You start checking all the organs to see if it can handle what they're about to do to you. Pick lines are starting in and ports are getting cut in. And they had to determine, is it in my bone marrow? He said, if it's in your bone marrow, we got another problem. They done bone marrow biopsy. Betsy's had one or two, not fun. And the poor little, I've got to tell you about Lisa, I'll make it quick, because Lisa's gonna come back here in a few minutes. But Lisa was the PA for Dr. Gravy. He said, you care if she does this? She's not done one. And I said, sure, I'll know in the hospital room, just me, Cindy wasn't even there, I don't think yet. And uh, you know, rip your drawers down and show your hind end to them. That's what he said. <laughs> she starts that knee right through the hip I pocket. I didn't say suffering humiliated you; it made you humble. So there you go. And they, that's where it began. That's they, they start that needle right through your hip pocket, guys. You got britches on your hip pocket. Right through that hip pocket is where that needle goes. I can't see it, but I you're wide awake. Hello. <laughs> Nothing, they don't give you nothing. They, they start pecking that needle, she's pecking that in there and I don't know if they're having a hammer, if they're taking, I don't know what they're doing. They're driving that needle through that pelvic bone and she's getting squeamish back there. I can hear Dr. Gravy, they're right here, you know? And he said, Lisa, you, you've got to hit it harder. You've got to drive it through that bone. She gives her a whack and runs it in the bone, through the cavity, all the way out the other side. I'm laying there like, good night. I get a discount? <laughs> Dr. Gravy says, and, and poor Lisa, she's having a fit. I mean, she's undone. She's about to lose it. Dr. Gravy says, we've got to pull this needle out and try again, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dr. Gravy says, I'm gonna do this one. Long story short, he went in, got the bone marrow, sucked that juice out, sent it off, no cancer in the bone marrow. But that helps a lot of, lot of tests to identify what you got, colonoscopies. Yeah, that's just routine stuff. Well, the um, test procedures were starting. Um, first round of chemos it was a CHOPR regimen. Every, every chemo's got its little names to it. About four months of that stuff. Um, four hour infusion, go home three or four days, rest, come back, do it again. Done that for about four months. Go do a CT scan, see how you're doing. Come back, do a CT scan early summer. Still there, Dr. Gravi says, I gotta hand you off to Vanderbilt. You need to get down there with a specialist, hematologist, oncologist that can deal directly with leukemia and lymphoma. Done that. Met a, a, a doctor from India, Dr. Reddy. She was a, a, a sweet lady and she said, we need to step up to the next level of chemo. And I had a little fun Friday, morning, Friday afternoon with the guys and I said, chemo's like, like going to the Buffalo Wild Wings. When you get your Wild Wings, you go to the sauce bar to, to doctor them up. Start on the left side, it's mild and it's honey barbecue, and then it gets modern, medium hot, then nine alarm, then you get over here to the right, it's gates of hell sauce. Okay, that's what chemo's like. So we're moving up the chart. She said, this is another strong arrangement. It's strong enough to where you've gotta be inpatient. Go to the hospital for three days, 24 hours a day, for three days, 72 hours, they'll be dripping drugs in you. Gallons, I don't know how many gallons of chemo that I've had. See, am I burn up? I don't know, I feel like it sometimes. Done that, go home and rest for a month, three weeks, 
come back for his second round of the three-day inpatient at Tanova North, dump the juice in, here we go, we should be good, because they said, you got to get to a transplant. If we don't get a bone marrow transplant, you're not going to live, but we got to get everything killed off or you waste your time doing a bone marrow transplant. Okay. <clears throat> second round should do it. Done the second round, <clears throat> come back in October, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, came back in October after the second round of the, of the medium sauce, you know, uh, they said, you still got problems. Things were still lighting up over here. Most of the tumors had shrunk away. The little golf ball, small ones, they had shrunk away. But this guy right here was fighting them pretty hard. And um, she said, we're gonna have to go in and do a surgery, cut all this stuff out. We were not killing it. So they, Halloween, Halloween day, 2012, they cut me open, took the spleen out, took the, the spleen, the tumor that's embedded in the spleen, part of the pancreas, a little bit of the lower left lobe area of the lung, took all that out, went home, got better. She said, come back in a month, let's scan you again, see if you're clear so we can get you to transplant. Came back early December and had another CT scan. That's a lonely place. If you've been in the CT scan room, you're in there by yourself. But I wasn't alone. I was not alone. Done that CT scan and Went back up the third floor of Vanderbilt Cancer Center, saw Dr. Reddy. It's a very sweet lady, but she had tears in her eyes. Cindy remembers this. She said, you lit back up down here. There's something that's still active that we're not, we can't, we, get, we gotta get rid of it. And they wanna get me to transplant, they can't. So she wrote down on a piece of paper, R-E-S-H-A-P, another we're to the right side of the sauce. We're up to the gates of hell, if you will. She said, I hate to give you. She wrote it down on a piece of paper. She said, take this back to Knoxville and give it to Dr. Gravy. She said, I hate to do this to you. But she says, we've got to. And it was five day inpatient with a stronger juice. I don't know, four bags hanging at a time, dripping in you, all these machines. I don't know how many gallons I got in five days. It was a gallon, gallon and a half a day, I guess five, six, seven gallons before the week. And on Thursday, day four, day four, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you just wore out, wore out. And uh, Lisa walked in the room Thursday afternoon. Remember Lisa? <clears throat> I do. <laughs> <laughs> she walked into the room Thursday afternoon and she said, how are you doing? And I've gotten to know Lisa over 11 months. You get to know these chemo nurses and chemo, they're, they're just good people. It takes a special person to do that stuff. I said, I'm doing good. She says, I said, I look good, don't I? I said, Lisa, I feel like poo-poo. What do you think I feel like? She said, let me listen to you. She said, you don't sound good. Blood pressure dropped to about 60 over 40. She said, barely get a blood pressure. I had so much fluid built up that I was just drowning kidneys shutting down. I wasn't getting rid of all this stuff dripping in. It wasn't going out. She said, we got to get busy. You're in trouble. They ran all these heart tests and long story short, they got me squared away. Lisa was an angel that afternoon and saw something and identified the problem. Got back home Friday, got her back home Friday afternoon. That was December, second week of December of 12. And I was practicing for the music on the stage right here that we were singing. And that's, the, that's the Christmas that some of you remember, Little Drummer Boy. I sang it right here. Landon stood right there playing his drums. And Cindy came through that back door on the second verse. And I thought, I'll not sing another song on this stage. I'll not live through the next round because I had another round of five days waiting on me. And I thought, I about died during the last round. And it was a, so much going on on that song. And somebody took a picture of us, us three on the stage. I mean, it was a small, she was a little, teen, early teenager. And I've got that picture on my dresser. That last verse says, when he smiled at me, pa rum pa pum pum And I looked at Landon standing right there, and he smiled over at me. Went to the next round, January, first week of January, went back over there, checked in for my five-day second round of juice. We got it killed off. 
Vanderbilt said, it's clear you've got days until it's going to grow back. Get done at work, clock out, leave, tell them you're coming to Vanderbilt for four months. Moved to Vanderbilt February, middle of February in 13. Left down there in June of 13. Got the transplant. Things were going pretty good in 13. 14, the winter of 14 hit. I had an abdominal surgery. Some of this junk blew apart. Had to go back and get it fixed up. March of, about March of 14, had a, a saddle pulmonary emboli. Blew a big clot to my lungs. If you have to pick a clot, don't pick a saddle PE. They hurt. They about kill you. 50-50 chance of surviving a saddle PE. Some of you know what that is right here in this room. Done that. End of 14. Lana had just got married in that fall, 14. Christmas, the 21st day of December, I walk into Vanderbilt and I, I knew something was going on. See, and I knew I had rashes all over me. My eyes were hurting and just, I had muscle issues going on. And Dr. Kasim from Africa, he said, you're in multi-organ rejection, my friend. You're in trouble. I said, well, what do we do? He said, well, we gotta get busy with some tests. 2015 began the test of the run uh, procedures, blood treatments, it's called photophoresis, done 32 treatments back and forth to Vanderbilt sometimes twice a week. Uh, the disease uh, killed the fluids to my eyes, my eyes stayed dry, uh, my skin, sometimes you can see my skin messed up, uh, muscle cramps, and it affects your muscles, it affects your kidneys and your bowels. I can't tell you how many pair of pants I messed up in 15 and 16. It was a running joke between me and Sydney. I mean, you'll, I was standing one day at Pet Boys buying some oil, and here it come. I could not control those muscles, could not control them. And here it comes, standing in Pet Boys. And I began to smell it, and I thought, oh, I got a kid out of here. Felt like a, felt like a three-month-old kid. Went out and sat in my car and just sat down there. And I called Sid and said, I'm headed home. Get some clothes and get some wet wipes. I keep wet wipes still in my drawer at work to this day. When I got to go, I still have to watch it. And it's awful the way the, the rejection disease killed my immune system and, and the things that it does. So anyway, battled through that in 15 and just, just, a, lot of, just a lot of junk. But God is a good God, and he never leaves us nor forsakes us. First of all, I just want to say, I just think Danny's a man's man. I mean, he, not only living and telling his story, but you see him here every single week. Keeps teaching, keeps doing everything. And uh, it's very inspirational. Um, a few months ago, uh, I was on a Saturday night, and my oldest son is stationed at uh, Fort Campbell. He was in the 101st Battalion. And um, he uh, was uh, going with some friends on Saturday night. And he called me and wanted to know he was in transition um, classes looking to decide whether he wanted to reenlist or whether he wanted to come on back home and try to pursue some other things. And, and we talked about different options that he had. and. And I remember the last thing that I said to him that night was on a Saturday night. And I said, Zach, I don't know why you're worried about this right now. You've got your whole life ahead of you. So the day went on. We didn't hear from him the next day. Um, he actually talked to uh, Sherry that night, too. He was looking for her. And I don't know why. Looking back now, I think it was God's design that he wanted... Zach could talk to both of us that night and she talked to him for a little while and on the phone and then that day went on, it was Sunday actually that very Sunday Katie was baptized that day here didn't hear from him which was, you know he's 23, I mean you know, you don't hear from him a whole lot sometimes and it wasn't, wasn't odd but it was, hadn't heard from him and um that night, it was just me and Nick at home. Sherry was, Sherry was gone. Katie was gone. And um, as I've told you before, nobody comes to our front door. Everybody comes to our side door. All their friends, welcomed or not, they come through the side door. And um, that particular night, I was in the kitchen. Nick was getting ready, and the um, doorbell rang. We both kind of met 
at the same time kind of perplexed because who's ringing the doorbell at 10 o'clock? And um, we opened that door, and I'll never forget seeing those two army chaplains on our front porch. And it still didn't hit me because I just talked to him. He's 23. It didn't hit me. And then when they said those words, are you Mr. Ammons? Yes. Are you the father of Zachary? Joel Ammons? We said, yes. And they said, we regret to inform you. It's either a phone call, a doorbell, changes your whole life. Everything that I knew to that point was done. I looked at my son and he had that same face he had when he was eight or 10 when his bike tore up. Dad, fix this. What are we going to do? I didn't know what to do. My first thought was, they came in, they told me the story and I asked them four or five times, are you sure? Do you know for a fact? Are you sure? Yes, Mr. Ammons, we know. And then my first thought was, oh my God, Sherry. How am I going to tell her? And then Katie. I don't want to lose a son, but I don't know what it's like to be 16 or 20 and lose your brother. So I called Sherry's parents to come to go get her. I didn't want to call her. Didn't want her to drive home. They went and got her. Katie was on her way home in a little bit, so I was hoping that nobody got to her and told her anything because I knew she'd just be coming home, so I thought, let's let her go home, and then we'll tell her. And so, of course, Sherry got home, and, you know, I know as a father, I'm in a mode at that moment trying to make sure that you know, we can get her to a place to sit down. What's going to be her reaction? Her parents were there. I remember being on the front porch and Nick was wanting to tell Katie when she got home. I remember Katie pulling up and I just heard the scream. And it was just so chaotic. Shortly thereafter, friends started to come. Word got out. Shortly thereafter, Rocky and Betsy came and we stayed up all night just talking with friends and, and, and we just didn't know what to do. There was never a script. We never planned for this. You don't, you don't plan to bury your kids. You, you, you hope and think that normal way of doing things is they're going to bury you. But I just remember thinking I wasn't mad at God. I, I wasn't I just remember thinking, how cruel is this? How awful is this? This is not right. And of course, as the days went on and everything went on, you know, the reality began to set in. And, uh, you know, it's so weird how life moves because Saturday night I was talking to him on the phone and Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon we're meeting at the funeral home to plan his funeral how fast things go. It was five months yesterday. And it's not any easier today to talk about than it was then. Because I can stay busy and be distracted. But when I'm alone or we're together as a family and something comes up, one of those songs that we sang this morning, I can still hear him singing that song. And then you get to the realization that your son is dead. And there is no way around that pain. No way around that pain. I know that God has something, you know, even today to talk about it. I've met so many people that have lost kids. I've met so many people that have went through tragedies and, and uh, I know that, you know, our, 
our desire is in our life is to every day honor him by how we tell his story and how we live our lives and try to be and try to be honoring to God to tell people about pain. We were at a home last night. A friend of ours passed away, died on the way to the hospital. 55 years old, died on the way to the hospital Friday morning. And we were there last night and just all the people in the living room again, it was just replaying everything all over. But we were able to sit down and feel what his wife felt and their family and their kids. We felt that. And that's what we'll do the rest of our lives. We'll do everything we can to help other people deal with some of the pain that life brings you unexpectedly. The Bible teaches us that God put man in a perfect world, no sickness, sorrow, pain, suffering, death. But God wanted a relationship with us. He didn't want us to be robots, so he had to give man the freedom not to follow him, to say no to him. And of course, Adam and Eve took that option. We talked about this men's retreat. We, we, what we learn from history is we don't learn anything from history. What we learn from the Bible is we don't learn anything from the Bible. But Adam and Eve thought that there was some way of life better than what God had told them to do. And we do that all the time. We don't learn from them. And so they chose to sin. And when they did, they brought a curse on the whole world. So now the world's full of sickness, sorrow, suffering, pain, and death. Before then, there would have been no hospitals, no funerals, no cancers, no doctors, no chemos. And so now we live in the curse. In Romans 8, it says creation groans awaiting its redemption. We groan within ourselves because we were made for perfect. And we're now in a world where nothing is. And then it says that God himself groans. Why? Because it wasn't supposed to be this way. God loves us. And so he sends his son in the world to die on the cross for our sins So that one day, uh, Galatians says, he might deliver us from this present evil age. Jesus died on the cross so that one day we'd be out of the curse, back into his kind of world, which is though it has no sickness, sorrow, suffering, pain, or death. It says in Revelation, he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. But in the meantime, we're here. And uh, God does not exempt anybody here from pain. In John 16, Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. He promised us we'd have problems. So the question is, are you going to go through those problems walking with the Lord, or are you going to go through them by yourself? You're going to go through some valleys, and, and there, some of them are going to be deeper and darker than you ever imagined they could be. The question is, will you go through that valley with a relationship with God that sustains you, as you've heard with Joel and Danny, or are you going to go in that alone? Well, so what has God promised? One, as, as they both talk, God has promised to be with us. We may feel lonely, and you will feel lonely when your world goes upside down. But feeling lonely does not mean you're alone. And sometimes when we wonder where God is, he's carrying us. He's absolutely carrying us. And so he's promised to be with us. He's promised there would never be more honest than we can bear if we trust him. So if we walk with him, whatever we face in this life, we can make it. Doesn't mean it won't be painful. You know, with uh, Joel, I remember telling him, you know, with all the pain, you can't cure normal. It's normal to be devastated. It's normal to to be full of fear when uh, you find out you have cancer. It's normal to be angry when you find out your son has died. And all those things are normal. You can't cure normal. But God has promised that he would be enough in us that we could make it through. Sometimes victory is just hanging on. Sometimes victory is just getting out of bed the next day. It's not always jumping around hooting and hollering. But as you go ahead and walk with the Lord, you see the confidence and the reality of what God can be in a person's life. Romans 8, 28, 9 tells us that God, not only, you know, these things happen in this cursed world and God uses them for good. And he, and he, and he changes us through our pain. I guarantee you pain never leaves you the same. Some people get bitter, probably most do. Other people get better. God never wastes a hurt. So when pain comes into your life, God says, if you'll let me in on this, I'll do something redemptive with it. Doesn't bring your son back. Doesn't mean you're cured. But you'll go to a level of relationship with God that you never knew. 
you'll go to a level of usefulness with people that you never knew. Just as Joel's talked about when he now can go in where somebody's lost somebody, where you know Danny can has ministered to all these doctors and nurses and everybody who's seen his witness and the testimony he's given around here. So God will be with us. He'll turn bad to good. So that's, that's if, if there's no other reason to know Christ and there's a million more, that's enough of one. You can go through pain and loss and all it is is pain and loss and all it does is hurt. Or you can go through pain and loss and a God who made you will reveal himself to you in it, will give you strength to survive it and even thrive eventually from it. Reveal himself to you, make you useful to people and change your forever because of it. So that's what we're talking about this morning. Danny, tell me what, uh, tell me what you've learned about God through this. Well, God is faithful. <clears throat> we can say that. We can sing it. We can, we can talk that talk until you get it hit head on. And th there's a verse that's been big for me. And um, a friend of mine quoted this own verse to me when I was first diagnosed. And it's a beautiful verse in Psalms 121. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of the heaven and earth. Wait a minute. The one that made the heaven and earth is going to step out and help me? Yep. That's what it says. So God is... Um, uh, God has shown me that whatever we, wherever we find ourselves, there's something we can do. There's somebody we can become. Uh, there's a guy that told a story that lived in Los Angeles, California several years ago. And I'll never forget it. And the, the, the talk of his story was bloom where you're planted. And he said, every morning I drove to work on the interstate in L.A., and he said it was like six or eight lanes both ways, concrete, just a concrete jungle. And he said there's one spot where the, up against the middle barrier, the concrete barrier, where dirt and debris and whatnot had gathered in this little pocket. Somehow a flower seed found that pocket. And he said I would drive by in the traffic, crawling by, and he said I'd look for that little pocket every day, and the flower was growing. And day after day, that flower kept growing, and pretty soon that flower bloomed. And he said, of all places, for a flower to grow and to bloom and to give me joy was on that interstate in L.A. in Los Angeles, California. And that God spoke to me to say, you know, wherever we find ourselves planted, it might not be the beautiful gardens like you see in the home and garden, it might be against the concrete barrier with a bunch of debris, but that was enough for the flower to bloom and to make a difference in this guy's life. I want to bloom wherever God plants me. Amen. I want to bloom. Joel, what did you learn about God during this? Well, you know, I thought I'd been through some things in my life. I mean, you, you walk through things with yourself, with your family, with other people, and you know, I'd seen some things that, you know, was tough and that kind of thing, been through some things that were tough, but I just had no idea, you know, what suffering or tough was until this happened. I had no idea. I thought I did, but I had no idea. And I, I just remember I never, I never felt like I'd felt. Um, you're, you're trying to provide strength for your family, because that's what you feel like you're supposed to do. But yet at the same time, I remember one day going up the steps. We have two levels of steps in our house. And I remember one day getting to that second level and my whole body just, just hurt. I just couldn't hardly get up the second set of steps because my whole body just ached. But I think what I learned and what our family has learned the most is is how, much, how strong God is and how much he's willing to give us the strength that we need sometimes just to get up. Sometimes it's more than that. Sometimes it's a little bit more every day. But, but the strength that he provides and the willingness 
that he provides and how much he really does care um, for you when you're going through those most difficult times. I, I just never realized how strong God could be in your life when you feel like that there's no way in this world you're going to survive. And he shows you, yeah, you will. You'll survive and you'll get stronger and you'll make a difference in this and you'll become more than what I want if you'll stay with me. You know, the truth is that life, even when life is brutal, God's still good. He's still good. And he loves us. Um, last thing, last question. What uh, here, hopefully most of these people haven't been in a valley uh, like the ones you guys have been in. What advice would you give them now uh, before they face their valley someday? Well, there's a lot of people, <clears throat> church family, work family, community. There's a lot of people out there that, that's going to help you. I, I, in, in this service right here, there's countless, countless people. And if I told you some of the things people have done for Cindy and I, it would it, it, it mess your mind up. We have seen the hand of God step in to our lives. So what do you do? You hold on to what you know to be true. This stuff in this book is either real or it ain't. I choose to believe that it is absolutely 100% real and I have seen it happen in, in our, my life. Cindy and our kids have seen God step into. So you don't give up, you keep going, you keep holding on because God is, I don't understand it all. I told a guy that to lose your health and slowly continue to lose it is tough. Those of you who know me know I love to work and I work hard. And to not be able to do that with my lungs goofed up now, that's my hardest challenge right now is just having air. So uh, God is there to sustain us. He's not forgot who Danny and Joel and fill in your name is as we walk through the hard spots, the trials and tribulations, the interruptions of life, because God's in those interruptions, I promise you. Um, just to kind of repeat basically what I said Friday night. I mean, I think that um, God knows ahead of time what's going to happen in our lives, obviously. And... Um, I look back at, you know, when you can relax a little bit and start to look back at your life over the last couple of years, um, I think it was totally God's will for our family to end up here. I mean, I've known you for a long time, but I, I, I just, I think it was totally God's will for our family to be here. Um, I told the group Friday night, I don't think we know how blessed we are every single week to have messages where every single thing that's brought up in a message is backed up by scripture. There's a constant steady diet of God's word, whether it's through message or the genuine music that we sing and the people that lead us every week is so genuine. And, um, and so I think that was part of God's plan. It's preemptive. You know, you get a steady diet of, of what God is trying to do, get you ready. Rocking really wanted me to encourage me to be a part of a small group and teach this, teach a community group. And, and oh my goodness, my, my community group, um, they have been such a blessing in our life. I mean, I mean, such a blessing. I can't tell you enough um, about those, those people in our small group. But I think the only thing you can do is to live your life every day the best that you can and, and give everything you can in relationship with God because when that time hits, and it will come, there, there's, some, there's some storms we all can avoid, but there are some storms, there's a phone call, there's a doorbell you, you won't be able to avoid. No matter how close you are to God, no matter how much you love God, they're going to come. And I think with, if you're spending time along with God, you're faithful in church and in worship and in a small group and have people around you, that's when all that blossoms. Because there's no way you can sit and prepare for anything like this or like what we've went through. There's no way you can sit and prepare for it. 
But you can live your life every day. And I go back to, to uh, Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, when they said they found favor with her. All she was doing every single day was doing what she knew was right. And she was faithful. And she was obedient. And she was just every day. And then her life changed that day. And I think that's the only thing we can do. And I think that's huge when storms come because you have to have a foundation. Otherwise, um, you know, your world's going to fall apart. But I also learned too from God that you really do need people. And this church and some of Sherry's work and my work and, and the people, we would have never, ever, ever made it through what we did without God's people and our friends. Never. Because your tendency is to withdraw. And our friends and our family just wouldn't let us. And they were there for us every single day, all the time. Text, I can't tell you the number of texts I've got from so many people here at a certain time during the day when I was just down and out and got to text. So many things that, that um, but that's all about the connection before. And I think it's so important. If you're not in a small group, if you're not spending time alone with God, I, I mean, all those things get you ready for one of those disasters that come. You know, one of the sad things is today, we think church is this, this big room with a band and a sermon and all that. No, what they just described to you is what church is. It's relationships. It's being there for people. It's people being there for you. And uh, you know, obviously you're going to need God when you hit your valley. And you're going to need God in people when you hit your valley. I'm glad you, you both talked about that. You'll find, you said, well, I don't need anybody. Well, you'll find out you do when you don't have them. And a bunch of you, we sit up here and beg for you guys to get in community groups. Some of you have never done that. And when you, go, when you hit your valley, you're not going to be surrounded by a bunch of people stepping over themselves to help you. You're going to be pretty much alone. And you're going to miss what the church was supposed to be for you. And then sadly, if you're not in a group, you're not being the church for other people. So you need to see, see Brian, see Grant, and get yourself plugged into community group. Second thing, and Joel mentioned this, is you, if you're going to walk with, Lord, with the Lord in your storm, you better find him before it. You better be walking with him when you get there. Because if you get in the storm, it's going to be hard to find him. So you just realize that. I want to go back and, you know, Danny talked about bloom where you planted. At any point in life, all you can do is the best you can do right now where you are with what you have. You know, we don't get to choose where that spot is. If Danny could choose that spot, he wouldn't have cancer. Joel could choose that spot, he'd have Zach back. We don't get to choose that spot. But at every spot in our life, we get to choose that, you know what? I'll do the best I can for the Lord where I am with what I have. I'll be the best I can be in my new normal. And your normal may change several times throughout your life. Last thing I want to say this. What do you do when, when your world goes upside down? When you pray and your prayers aren't answered? When you hope for a miracle, a healing, for somehow time to be reversed and you don't get it? What do you do? Well, two things. One, hang on to what you know to be true. And I know you remember years ago, two things. I said, if there's two things in the world I know, I know that God is good and God loves me. You know how you, most anchors have the bar that goes down then the two hooks? God loves me. God is good. So when I'm hurting, when I'm upside down, when I don't have any answers, I've just got questions, I, and, and there's so much I don't know, I'm going to go back and hang on to what I do know. And I do know that whatever's going on around me, God is good and he loves me. So those should never be questioned. So, uh, so that's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is you do whatever you can do. And sometimes what you got to do is get treatments. Sometimes what you got to do is see a counselor. Sometimes what you got to do is just take some time off and recover. Sometimes what you got to do is get on some medication to get you through the hump. 
but you do what you got to do. Remember Job when he was so sick and uh, probably at the point of death, he got a pot stir, a, a broken piece of pottery and scraped himself. Why did he do that? He just did whatever he could do. So hang on to what you know to be true and do what you know to do. And so what part of what do you know to do? Keep spending time with the Lord. Stay in church. Stay in community. Don't withdraw. You know, push yourself out there where you ought to be, where God wants you to be. Don't cave in to, to disappearing and hiding because Satan loves to get people alone. Our secrets keep us sick. And when he gets us alone, he can have us. So that's why we need other people around us, loving on us, encouraging us, sometimes speaking the truth into our lives when we're struggling with believing that truth. So, you know, I love you two guys. I have prayed for you, wept for you, wept with you. Uh, let's just let them know how much we, we love and appreciate them. You know, one thing, the, the, the best is yet to come, folks. Don't forget that. This life is tough and it hurts and it, it but the best is yet to come. Absolutely. And Betsy had, gave me the privilege to sing that song, What a Day That Will Be When My Jesus I Shall See. When I look into his face, the one that saved me by his grace, he'll take me by the hand and walk me through the promised land. And I'm gonna say, he's gonna say, Daniel, look at this, look at this. There's Jacob, there's, there, there's Martha, there's Mary, there's Paul, what? What a day, glorious day, that's gonna be. Absolutely. When you know the Lord, somebody knows the Lord when they die, they won. You know, we typically walk over caskets and feel sorry for people. We, and we do feel sorry for those left behind who, who've suffered the loss. But frankly, we ought to look at the, the deceased person. If they knew the Lord said, you lucky dog. You, you're at the grand prize. You don't have any more suffering, sorrow, pain. You would never come back here. You're in the presence of Jesus. And in a, in a zillion years, you'll never get over him. That's how incredible he is.